Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I think everyone's here. Or we're pretty full, so we'll get started. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Sarah Adamchak. I'm the supervising attorney with the International Human Rights Clinic. Um, and this is part of one of the things the clinic does, which is our Human Rights Practitioner Series. Um, so we're happy to have our first event this semester with Lenny Benson um, from, the New, um, from New York Law School and the Safe Passage Project. Um, so one of the projects, when we're thinking about designing uh, speakers for this, year, uh, for this semester, we wanted to focus on particularly some human rights issues here in the States. Um, and I, as everyone's aware of, um, of the media coverage of the refugee crisis in Europe, we wanted to focus on a, a bit of a forgotten crisis, which is unaccompanied minors coming from Central America, from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Mexico. And so I'll, I'll let Lenny speak much more about this. Um, and I just, yeah, maybe to hand it over to you. And before I do, um, I just want to thank also our co-sponsors for the event. Um, so we are co-sponsoring this event with the Children's Law Clinic, the Center for International and Comparative Law, Duke Human Rights Center at the Keenan Institute for Ethics, Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, and then the student groups are the International Law Society and the Human Rights Law Society. So thank you, thank and you. welcome to Lenny Benson. Thank you. All right, let's pull up the PowerPoint. So very first thing I want to say is, um, yes, I am a law professor. I am an academic. I teach four classes. I am describing to you my pro bono work. So when you are sitting in the chairs today and saying, I don't possibly have time, not an excuse with me. <laughs> and as I was telling Sarah, whenever I speak, and I've done about 65 of these presentations now around the world, um, but particularly when I'm in New York, I don't feel good about it unless I get several people coming up to me and saying, how can I help? So what I'd like you to do as you're listening to this presentation is to think about how you're going to operationalize what you're learning today. Whether you're going to go work in the government, or you're going to stay here in North Carolina, or you're going to go into a large law firm practice, or you're going to continue here at the law school, every single person in this room can be part of the solution or at least the protection of human rights for children. All right, let's see if I can figure out my clicker. I got it. In this presentation, I'm going to go through slides very, very quickly. I have two sets of slides. Uh, this is one you're going to see, and a much longer one that Sarah Domchek has the link to. It's a program I did at Elon Law School last year that has North Carolinian law in it. So for those of you in your children law clinic, it's very specific to North Carolinian law. Here for this presentation, I kept it a little more general. I am going to do the slides very quickly, but they're available to you later. If you just contact Sarah, she'll give them to you. So we're going to talk about who's a child, as if we think we know that, right? Only in law do we have to define things. <laughs> and the immigration statute uh, in Section 101, which is the definitional section, takes more than two pages of close text to define a child. And then we're going to learn a little bit about who's a refugee. This would be you know, a whole semester-long course, uh, 28 hours of lecture, discussion, hundreds of pages of reading. I'm going to give you the overview version. Who's responsible for these children? Probably the toughest question I get in any talk I give is, why is this the United States' responsibility? Why isn't this responsibility of the parents of the children or of the sending countries? Who is coming to the US? And then who makes the decisions about the well-being of these children? So who is coming to the United States? This is probably the image we're most familiar with if we're talking about Central America. This is the train known as La Bestia, or the Beast. It's a freight train that runs from the southern border of Mexico along Guatemala's border up into the United States. Well, actually, it doesn't go quite all that far. For many, many years, this was the freight train people would hop. And it sounds kind of romantic and idyllic. <laughs> it is extraordinarily dangerous. The gangs now are controlling the trains more and more. The Mexican government is also interdicting on the trains. They've, they've spent millions of dollars, probably US supplied money, I'm not entirely sure, to ex make the trains go faster. And there are people who lose limbs, who lose their lives trying to do these freight trains. So we will come back to Central Americans. But there's other ways that children do arrive in the United States. They also arrive 
from, in boats from the Caribbean. Although lately, the Caribbean children from Haiti, some of them had been displaced by the earthquake into Mexico, and they were actually given temporary status there. But poverty and danger and lack of adult protection is trying to have them reunify with relatives in the United States. And so they're showing up at our southern border, too. Uh, people from the Dominican Republic tend to come with visas, and some of them overstay. We also work with a large Dominican population in New York. This image comes from the CBP, Customs and Border Patrol website. It's the classic image we all think about, crossing the desert, Arizona, California, Texas desert. But what I want to ask you is, who is this man? Just in your own imagination, is this dad? Could be, dad with two small children. Is this a brother? Is this an uncle? Probably it's a professional smuggler. Uh, we definitely have professionalized, or because of the toughness of our border and the push factors that are sending so many to the United States, many families hire what they call coyote, uh, the wily one, the one who knows the paths. Uh, the, the rates vary. Um, sometimes the family might be told it's 6000 and then they're extorted for up to $50,000. And then there are children that arrive with visas or on false U.S. passports. And our project meets children who came when they were very young or children who came with a visa and overstayed. So back to La Bestia, in the last two years alone, 102,000 children without an adult or a guardian have been apprehended at the southern border. That's enormous. Border apprehensions are at an all-time low. In part, that's because we spend $18 billion on immigration enforcement. We do have a wall at the border. It's not a unified wall all the way across. We also have a wall of our Coast Guard. And we sometimes even have our National Guard. And we also have very well-trained Border Patrol and a lot of technology. So children, when they arrive, are still coming. And this is what the train might look like, very crowded. Under the law. If you meet the definition of unaccompanied alien child, and I apologize, this is where I discovered I had a typo. At the time of appreh apprehension has, neither a parent nor a legal guardian accompanying the child, by statute, the Trafficking Victims <coughs> Reauthorization Protection Act, under U.S. domestic law, we may not treat that child as an adult and summarily expel them. Our immigration statutes, uh, this is a big part of what I teach in my immigration course, we do have a provision in the law since 1996 called expedited removal. If you're an adult and arrive at our border, an international airport or port of entry, and you even have a visa, our border officers, if they don't believe you, if they believe you're lying or the visa's false or the visa's inappropriate or you don't have any paperwork, we can summarily deport you. And it's a five-year bar, and if you re-enter after that, you could be criminally prosecuted. It can also really be a bar to future legalization or regularization through any sponsorship. But children are different. We take the position if they're unaccompanied and under the age of 18, we should not use that expedited border patrol control uh, tool. I just want to pause on that for a minute because a lot of us think of immigration laws going to immigration court, there's some kind of administrative trial, uh, maybe there's an appeal to federal court, not with expedited removal. And today, expedited removal is double the number of removals that we have through our court system. So you may have heard NPR saying two weeks ago, removals are down. Well, they're down in the courts but they're not down at the border. So I know I contradict some of the politicians. We actually have a lot of border control, but we do have a child migration issue. Now, who is a child is also a complex definition, as I mentioned already. In immigration laws, until you're 21, or if you get married. If you get married, you're no longer a child. We can question anyone getting married under 21, whether they should be thought of as a child, but okay, all right. Juvenile is another phrase used in the law, and even minor. And these terms of art become really important when you're working in the field. But again, if you're under 18 and you're not with an adult, then you're one of the people in this chart. So I took this data from the Border Patrol Southern Sector Apprehensions. They don't list other countries like KT. But um, in my work, when we volunteer at the Immigration Court now almost once a week, and we have a big data set, um, I'm finding every week out of 35 children, about two are from the Punjab region of India. Mm -hmm. So that's not showing up in this data. They're apprehended at the southern border. And if we had time, we could explore what are the human rights issues going on in that part of India and, and the region in Pakistan that young people are trying to come. But this is the majority of what this Border Patrol reports. Now, I put Mexico in red because under our treaty agreement with Mexico and Canada, if you're an unaccompanied youth, we can push you back immediately. We believe the Mexican authorities when they tell us they have appropriate facilities for children, that they'll interview them, they'll take care of them, they're their children, they will make sure they have child protection. 
Advocates who work in Mexico, however, say they're usually interviewed and released on the same day. Um, one scholar in Mexico, her data, I can't verify it, 72,000 children arrested at the Mexican border under the age of 11 in the last five years. Why are children under the age of 11 coming to the U.S. border, getting caught, and being sent back into Mexico? What's going on? Well, probably those children are trying to find their parents. We have the largest undocumented population is of Mexicans. And number two is El Salvador. And number three is Guatemala. And number four is Honduras. And so, yes, many of these children are trying to join relatives that are already in the United States. But because those relatives have not had a path to any kind of legal status, there's no way they can legally sponsor their children. However, that's not everyone. And it's not the main push factor. Why are the children coming so quickly? This is, a, I borrowed this picture from the Pew Hispanic Trust. They did a study. They took the Border Patrol data and what data were reporting the originating point. And so I'm going to talk about these three countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, where we cannot push the children back immediately under existing law, nor do I think we should. Uh, and you can see that um, there are definitely pockets of the country where children are not coming, uh, but it is pretty diverse across the region. We call this the Northern Triangle. If you look at the UN data on the war on drugs or the most dangerous countries in the world, these three countries are in the top five. Now, you don't see that on the front page of what's your local paper, the Raleigh Times or something? I'm sorry, I don't know your. Sorry, I don't know the North. I, I've only been to North Carolina once before, forgive me. And I grew up in Arizona. I can tell you the Arizona Republic does not put every day stories about this region. Instead, we hear about ISIS, we hear about ISIL, we hear about Syria, and we should. But why are we not learning more about the violence and endemic failure of civil society in these countries? In addition to the record number of children, this is 2014 data, see this uh, column in the pale yellow, the, the beige color, those are family units being apprehended. Family unit, by and large, is a woman with children under the age of three, maybe more than one. So a baby in arms and a toddler. And some of you may have volunteered at Dilly or Carnes this summer, gone down to the detention centers that we have in New Mexico. We close that one now in Texas. Bed space for 3,700 family detention. Seems like an oxymoron to me. Uh, but it's primarily women with very small children. They've been screened in. Because remember, an adult can be expeditedly removed, can be turned back at the border. And her children would go with her. However, under our law, you have a chance to make what's called a credible fear of persecution, a chance to say, I need an asylum protection. And these women have been held while they're making those credible fear determinations. Now, because they're fictionally, legally fictionally, as if they're still at the border, they don't have a right to an attorney. So the attorneys that have been going down have basically been helping people prepare, but they can't have an active role in either bond hearings or credible fear determinations. 66,000 children in 2014, 68,000 mothers with infants. Occasionally, there was a father. And those are people we didn't turn away immediately. We also turned away and deported many, many other people over the age of 18. So I'm going to focus on child protection and not talk about the adults with children, but maybe in the Q&A, if any of you want to ask more about that, I can. So in the United States, we have overlapping jurisdictions about how to process the children. I mean, probably in law school, maybe even if you've taken family law, I surveyed the faculty at my school. They don't even teach child protection in the normal family law class. They say, oh, no, that's a special seminar. You know, they learn about marriage and the nature of marriage and divorce and the property dissolution. We always study property in school, don't we? But we don't talk honestly about children and their rights and how autonomous are they. And we have a confusing patchwork, so watch out. You can't read this. I know that. You can't read that either. Those are flow charts about what the process of who's going to touch the children's lives. Within 72 hours of apprehension, this is a scene of a, a, a Border Patrol station last summer. They're supposed to be processed and turned over to a licensed juvenile care facility. And the agency that does that has the name Office of Refugee Resettlement, except it has nothing to do with resettling or refugees. 
not that division. They are simply the only federal agency that had any competence at all to take care of children. We don't have really a federal child protection system. We have children are taken care of by our states. And so the federal government was in a bit of a conundrum when children began to arrive in record numbers in the mid-2000s. And so they started with a program of about bed space for 1,500, then 3,000, then 7,000. It's over 10,000 now. And we do spend quite a bit of money on this. Uh, last summer, Congress appropriated an extra $9 million uh, for social workers and limited legal services for some of the kids in detention. Very bad picture. I'm sorry. I'm not the best PowerPoint slide artist. I took the data of where ORR, the federal government, released the children to be housed in various states. And so these are the top states. And North Carolina, I put you in, you have 730 this year. But pending in North Carolina's immigration court are more than 6,000 cases. And I'm going to talk about what's happening in some of those cases because it is right here. Your immigration court is located in Charlotte. Um, in New York, you see 2,229. Now, I really feel like what I should have also done is put the numbers from last year because last year our number was 7,800. So it was slower this year. In 2015, October of 2014 to today, we had much fewer apprehensions, much fewer arrival rate. Is it because the countries have gotten safer? No. Guatemala's government fell in a corruption coup. Um, 622 murders in El Salvador in June alone. Honduras, they closed the high schools last year. So it's not like it's better in those countries. But we've given millions of dollars to Mexico to do interdiction. And Mexico is taking the children into apprehension and detaining. Now, does that sound a little bit like Hungary and Croatia? We don't have the same kind of Dublin agreement they have in the European Union, but we do have an expectation under the international refugee regime that the first receiving state will do the process. So how many asylum applications did Mexico grant last year for children? 18. We know hundreds of thousands went through, and hundreds of thousands have been deported. All right, so why these states? Arizona had 150. That's my home state. Anyone have a theory of why California, Florida, Texas, North Carolina, uh, that's Maryland with one, Virginia is almost as many, New Jersey has almost as many, and New York. Why, why would it be those states? Yes. Family ties? Yes, this is where Central Americans <laughs> have settled, a lot in the D.C. area. You know, I began an immig immigration lawyer. I was a partner in a big corporate law firm, but even from my earliest days as an associate, I did asylum work pro bono, mm -hmm. and I mostly did Central American cases. And we, the civil wars of Central America in the 80s did lead to a lot of displacement and people coming to the United States. So these are really where children are going. They're reunifying with some kind of relative. 85% are released to a parent, a brother, or another close relative like an aunt, uncle, or grandparent. But all children are put into removal. And ICE, this is a T-shirt from their website. You know, they say police. They're actually not police. They're immigration customs enforcement officers. And immigration law is a civil enforcement scheme. And because it's civil and not criminal, the right to free counsel does not yet attach. Not yet. Okay, wait, you have class action pending. I'll talk about that in a second. The government is represented by a counsel from the Immigration Customs Enforcement. The judges are are lawyers. They're actually not ALJs or civil service judges, but they're, they're knowledgeable. It's part of the Department of Justice where you have this trial. Every single case gets put into removal. That's one of my critiques. We don't have to do it that way. Um, but I have talked with ICE people at the highest level, and they say, we don't have a federal protection system for children. We'll lose track of these kids. They say this with, with sincerity, unless we prosecute them. By prosecuting them, we're keeping track of them. And, and, and it is actually true. They often cooperate with defense counsel to try to protect the children or try to get their best interests. So joining ICE is not necessarily a bad job if you want to do human rights work for children because they are an agency that's taken responsibility for keeping track of and processing these cases. So this class action that was filed by the ACLU and some other nonprofits on the West Coast of the United States, it is a nationwide class action. It's been pending 20 months now. A federal judge has refused a preliminary injunction. The basic argument was the Constitution requires due process. Due process requires a lawyer. We're talking about Fifth Amendment guarantee of due process, not Sixth Amendment, which would be criminal law. And the judge has not ruled. We're in the discovery phase. I say we because I'm amicus in the case. Um, the basic idea is that you can't expect children to navigate the complex system I'm about to describe if they don't have a lawyer. How many cases are in the court? We see the spike in 2014 there. 
in North Carolina, more than 6,300, but in the entire country, more than 63,000. Mm -hmm. And even though the government has put these cases on a fast track, they call it the priority docket. The nickname is either the rocket docket or the surge docket. 21 days from the time the court receives a charging document, that's the notice to appear that starts the removal proceeding, child must have a hearing before the judge. This is what it looks like in New York. They give us a ceremonial courtroom. It's not a real courtroom. They, they use it just for trainings and so forth. And you see law students and lawyers sitting with youth. And we greet the children at the court. And uh, we greet them in English and Spanish. We wear badges that say we're there to help. And I don't speak Spanish, so I say horrible things to children, like, um, ayuda por los niños en no se habla español. And even that's probably not right. And, but I smile a lot. And my team speaks Spanish, lots of my volunteers. And we guide the young people with our clipboards and our, our suits into the screening room. They don't have to talk to us. 99% will. And we then, are, the court waits while we do that screening interview. Then we stand as friend of the court in the, in the courtroom. Friend of the court meaning we're not representing the child. We're there to assist the process in the court. Some people have said I'm evil for doing that, that I'm enabling the government to rush these cases through. I dispute that. What I ask for as friend of the court is please may I have time to find pro bono counsel. And at least in New York, the judge always says yes. Now here in Charlotte, you have a slightly different court. Last year when I was speaking at Elon, it was a big immigration conference. They hold one every year. The room was filled, 300 immigration attorneys. That day, the, ju the judge in um, Charlotte was hearing the first juvenile docket, and she ordered 400 children deported in absentia that day. In New York, they won't order you deported for your first failure to appear. They, they know that the paperwork is taking time to catch up with the children, and they will wait to the second time. But um, there is some data that's starting to come out, and we find that if you're unrepresented, 90% of the children lose their case. Either they get an order of removal or they get an order in absentia, meaning they weren't there, and there's an order of deportation in their file. But if they are represented, close to 85% win. And by win, I mean either securing permanent status in the United States or securing a closure of the case. Because prosecutorial discretion is part of every prosecution scheme. Your DA, your OSHA department, your Department of Safety and Health here in the state of North Carolina, nobody can prosecute every violation. And the Obama administration has deported more people than any other administration, you know, the last five combined. 2.4 million people have been deported under the Obama administration. But the priority is adults with criminal records and national security. Children are not a priority. On the other hand, the president is very concerned about a deterrence effect and so doesn't want to give these new children administrative closure or prosecutorial discretion. So children who arrived several years ago might get their case closed. Children today, they are officially taking the position, case-by-case -case decision, unlikely to close the case. Child might get an order. You will hear Vice President Biden and President Obama do public addresses that say these children do not qualify for relief and they need to go home. We're going to be courteous to them. We're going to make sure they're safe, but we're going to work on repatriation. My slide, you can't read it all. There's many forms of relief these children qualify for. At least in New York, in my experience, 80 to 85 percent of the children qualify for relief if they have a lawyer. Just a real quick note on trauma. These children have traveled 3,000 miles. Catholic Charities, which has a contract to see the children with physicians in the detention centers in New York, we have over 3,000 children in detention in New York on a yearly basis. They say that 60 to 80 percent, it's a little bit vague, have been sexually assaulted, either in the home country or on the journey. Sex is the currency when you're a migrant child, and it affects the boys as much as the girls. So in doing this work as a pro bono project, part of what my mission is, is to train people like you to do this work sensitively and not to try to re-traumatize the child by the process. By the time we see them at court, that child's probably been interviewed by a Border Patrol officer and by a social worker with the Office of Refugee Resettlement and then interviewed again by us at the court and then interviewed again when we find a pro bono lawyer. You can imagine talking about these very intimate, difficult things. It's very hard. And it's another reason I'm critical of a system. Using an a hostile adjudication system to resolve children's claims does not seem appropriate. Okay, I only have time to talk about two forms of relief. I'm going to do it super fast because I want you to be able to ask questions. And on our website at safepassageproject.org, 
Safe Passage Project. You've got to put the word project in there, .org. Under resources, there's lots of videos. They're not great videos. There's a manual. There's lots of resources. You can go in-depth and learn more. Let's talk about asylum. Children are allowed to seek asylum affirmatively. I realize my letters are a little dark here, but if you are in court, you normally don't get to go to the asylum office, but children do. So children, even though the case begins in court, the case at the court is suspended or administratively <clears throat> closed. Child's allowed to go to the asylum office. Here it's in Arlington, Virginia, and to make an a interview across a desk. And if you've never seen the documentary, Well-Founded Fear, it's from 1997. The haircuts are out of date and stuff, <laughs> but it's an hour and a half of your life that will really give you a clue into administrative law and asylum process. Recommend it. Sadly, though, we don't really have an asylum process designed for children. Um, last year, when all the children started arriving, the asylum office prioritized children's cases, slowing down adults' cases. They gave a one-hour webinar for their officers on how to interview children. Now, I think they've caught up a little bit, and there are some guidelines. We don't have special regulations or case law about children. So the median age of the children is 14. Last year, it dropped to between 11 and 12. Picture the middle schooler in your life a nephew, a niece, a brother, a sister, someone you know, someone who you were yourself, and you're going in for the most important interview of your life. Normally, um, if you are denied at the asylum office, you do get a chance to go back to court, and that's what's happening with these children. Okay, again, children who are under 18 and without an adult get this opportunity to have the non-confrontational asylum interview. This is the statutory definition of who is a refugee or can seek asylum in the United States. Very first thing is you have to be outside your country of origin. So some people would say, let these children in El Salvador apply at our embassy in El Salvador. And Vice President Biden did initiate a project called Central American Minor Project, where we're going to be doing some in-country processing. It was announced last year, 4,000 visas allocated, not one child immigrated under that process. It takes a really long time. And then they threw in one little criteria that's not part of the refugee law. You have to have a parent who's in status in the United States, so either in temporary status or lawful permanent resident, but not a citizen parent, because a citizen parent could use our regular system. It's going to get there. Cases are working through the system. Um, if you know of someone who has a parent here who has a status, they can sponsor their child there. It is an acknowledgement by our government that these children do meet the refugee definition, but they're not acknowledging it for the children that already got to our borders. So it's a case-by-case -case adjudication. You have to show that you've been persecuted. What is persecution to a child? How do I answer that? What is persecution to an adult? You know, you, you can't seek employment, you're hounded, you're, you're imprisoned, you're tortured. Well, for some of these children, it's lack of security. It is being sexually assaulted. It is being threatened. Um, but it has to be, quote, on account of one of these criteria. You know, when you hear the news and they say the Syrian refugees, it's a little more complicated than that. Many of the Syrians do qualify because it's religious discrimination. But if you're just fleeing conflict, civil war, you are a displaced person, but you may not meet the definition under international law of refugee. So again, it has to be on account of one of these five groups. And the one that we use, uh, the essential, has to be motivated. Your persecutor has to be motivated by your membership, your political opinion, your religion, your membership in a particular social group. The UNHCR has this concept much more broad, much more fluid. Um, and again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but they recognize a particular social group as a more uh, evolving, flexible category. Sadly, and I know you can't read all that, the last case at the bottom decided in February 2014, matter of MEVG, said that you are not a social group distinct in society because you're being persecuted. You have to be a social group first, and then if you are persecuted, then you might be able to make this claim. So your persecution cannot define the social group. Frankly, I think that's bullshit, um, and I'm litigating against it. But that is the position they took. Strangely, in August, they said, for women who are fleeing marriages of domestic violence, it's not. Um, that's, it, it's the persecution, fleeing domestic violence, that makes the social group not women. So why are the children's cases different? So there's, again, there's a lot of slides here. Sarah uh, Adamsik will give them to you. But this concept now, we need sociologists, we need law students to work on country conditions, to work on research, to show that the children 
that are being preyed upon in the lack of civil society, who don't have trusting police officers, there is no child protection system, they don't have foster care the way we do, they don't have orphanages the way we do, that it's, it's endemic in their society that this is a vulnerable social group, distinct within their own society. We could prove that by testimony in their legislatures, by the way their county or canton governments hold hearings, by the way um, they might be treated in the legal regime. We need research on that. Okay, second form of relief, special immigrant juvenile status, and that was the title of my talk. It's been in the law since um, 2000. It came out of California. Uh, social workers in California had children in foster care that were aging out, and they were undocumented. And they said, wait, we've worked so hard to educate, train, and support these youth, and they're going to become undocumented adults. And that seems like a waste of our society's resources. So they got a bill passed in Congress that said, you can sponsor yourself for immigration if a state court concludes that you were dependent on the state in some way, and you were abused, neglected, or abandoned by your parents, and it's not in your best interest to be returned to your country of origin. That was the original version of the statute. In 08, Congress amended it to say you don't have to be in foster care. You do have to prove the abuse, neglect, or abandonment. But, um, oops, my slide's out of order, sorry. <sighs> oh, I have slides out of order. All right, there we go. Uh, you do have to be abandoned, neglected, or abused, but now it's one or both parents, one or more parents. So many of these children do come from broken households. Mom or dad might be here, and mom or dad might seek a guardianship or custody determination. Here in North Carolina, you don't have the word guardianship used, something called third-party custody. Or it could be your aunt, or it could be your Sunday school teacher, or it could be a friend, or it could be one of you. Occasionally, one of our lawyers resigns from being a lawyer and becomes a legal guardian because there's no other adult to help the young person. It's complicated when you do that. But if we get that finding in state court, then we can get special immigrant juvenile status. So the statute summarized, you have to be under 21 years old. You have to be unmarried. Although, if you've been married and now you're divorced, you're a child again. You have to be declared dependent on a juvenile court. They used very vague terms because every state has a different name. Some call it dependency court, some call it family court, some call it surrogate's court, many, many different courts. It's going to depend on your state law. Reunification was one of the, both of the child's parents no longer viable, and it's not in the best interest of the minor to return to his or her country of nationality. So you rather like an asylum claim, you're proving the endemic violence in the home state or the disruption in education. Last year in San Pedro Sulo, the high schools closed. So how can it be in the best interest to return to that city if you have nowhere to go to school? Family law, international conventions, international law, domestic law, very clear we use this best interest standards. We have professionals that help determine what is in a child's best interest. It's not anywhere in the immigration statute except special immigrant juvenile status, but the immigration court has no authority to make that determination because they're not specialists. You have to go to your state family court. So imagine a child who's unrepresented, who's in removal proceedings before an immigration judge, and the judge says, you know, I think you might qualify for special immigrant juvenile status. Go to state court. How are they getting there? How are they getting into court? They're not in state foster care. They've been released to a family member, which the government calls a sponsor, but the sponsor's sponsorship is to make sure they show up at deportation court. And then they have to file petitions. Um, I just gave you the law is a little bit confusing. There's a statute. There's regulations. But the regulations are out of date, and they've been out of date since 2008. And the pending regulations have been pending for a couple of years, so be careful if you're doing research in this field because the regulations are out of date. And there's petition. There's forms. I mean, I actually should probably travel around with a sample petition and show you how thick it is. And then imagine a child doing all that work without a lawyer. That's my grandma with her two charges. My grandmother came as an unaccompanied child in 1909, uh, 1907. Congress had changed the law that year and said no children may arrive in the United States who are unaccompanied. She, her, my great-grandfather tried to smuggle her into the United States by hiring someone to pretend to be her parents. At Ellis Island, they found out they weren't her parents because there's no biological way that a 19-year-old man could have been the parent of a 9-year-old girl. And uh, <laughs> she was almost deported back to what today is Belarus. Uh, but luckily, the compassion of a pro bono agency called the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society connected her with her older sister, who was able to convince a judge that the family had enough money to support her. Um, 
this is an old part of our law. Grandma got status because we didn't have a quota system then. But today, we need something for children to do. So you could think this is a new phenomena. It is in the numbers, but it's an old phenomena. The first piece, person who came off the boat in Ellis Island was a young girl from Ireland, 15 years old. So how do you navigate through the multiple agencies, legal institutions, without representation? You can qualify for all these things, but if you don't have lawyers, they all just go away. So what do we do? I am a lawyer. I focus on you need to provide everyone with lawyers. That's not a popular position. Many, even some of you in this audience would say, well, wait a minute. We don't give people lawyers in housing court. We don't give children lawyers when they're going to be put into school detention or expulsion. We don't give people lawyers when they're fighting some of their public benefits uh, losses, right? So why would we give foreign-born people lawyers? Well, maybe we wouldn't have to give people lawyers if we had a better procedure. But I don't necessarily have all the answers. What I do have, though, is a commitment to a system of justice that has both substantive protection, as we're obligated to under international law and under our domestic law, but makes it real by giving an opportunity for each voice to be heard. And in my view, the complexity of the system requires us to definitely have attorneys to do that. So hopefully you're going to be some of those people. And I think that's my last slide. So did, did I stay almost in time? Perfect. All right. That's pretty good, that many slides. Sorry, if you've been out of order. So now it's question and answer time, I think. Um, and believe me, I don't mind if it's a very pragmatic, down in the dirt question. If you want to go into theory, we can do that too. But anyone who wants to just have me clarify something I said, or you want to ask me, why are these kids our responsibility? We'll go into 50 years of US hegemonic power in the region. <laughs> what, what would you like to ask? Surely, don't be brave. Come on. Yes? Can you um, give your name and, um, and your year and your age? So okay. Hi, so I'm um, Sarah. I have an LLM. Okay. Um, I'm working in a focus on international human rights law. Um, I'd like to ask about the right to education and when that kind of, if at all it's triggered, is it? Yes. It, I didn't so, have that in there. <laughs> yeah, yes. I think you mentioned it. It's when they're still um, in custody of, of border control. They, It's not triggered. And then <clears throat> is it when they're transferred to a sponsor? When they're transferred to the custody of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement, they do receive some education. Sometimes it's two hours a day, sometimes it's four hours a day. It depends on how long they're in custody and which setting they're in custody. So the best custodial settings that they have are some short-term foster care <laughs> settings. Um, there's a place 10 miles from my house that I visited. It's a beautiful juvenile detention center. So there's kids locked up for crime, and then there's the immigrant kids. They get um, public school teachers coming four hours a day to do some general instruction. But under Roe, <coughs> sorry, just pop the name of the case, not Roe versus Wade. Um, <laughs> pla pla um, Plyler versus Doe. It's a 30-year-old Texas Supreme Court decision. The state of Texas tried, because of all the border children, tried to say that unless you could prove you were legally residing in the United States, you couldn't go to the public schools. And the Supreme Court, by a five to four, very narrow decision, without using the traditional heightened scrutiny that we normally have in equal protection claims, um, in a very carefully worded opinion said, it would be unconstitutional to deny access to education. So that raises a fiscal question, right? So there are definitely displacement effects or short-term economic hardship or even long-term economic hardship for schools that receive these children when they're released to sponsors. So you saw those states, so what are they going to do? Well, Congress approved $14 million in um, supplemental funding to go to the school districts that had the largest number of children. But if you do the math, that's $233. Probably how much it costs to have our burritos today. So not enough per child, right? Um, so one of the sophisticated issues then in human rights work when you're advocating for generosity for people resettling is how are we going to not harm our local populations and most schools are funded by local school ta um, property tax and some subsidies from the federal government. We do have re refugee resettlement subsidies when we process you from overseas. We don't have it when you apply inside the country. So we probably need to add that to have some resettlement money. But also because we do fund our schools by property tax, immigrants rent homes and 
when you rent, you pay your landlord, and your landlord pays property tax. So they actually are contributing to the tax rolls, but there is a displacement effect. So they're entitled to education. I'm not familiar with what's happening here in North Carolina, but if it's anything like New York, in Long Island, and in a, in a county called Rockland County, which is the first county west of the Hudson, north of New Jersey, the schools have been put under court-ordered monitors because they were taking all the Spanish-speaking children, putting them in a basketball gym, taking role and saying, go home. Um, that's not school. And so they're, they're under civil rights monitors now. And then you have to think about what the reasoning is for having children in school, um, because this process does take time. The average case that we work with, with our pro bono lawyers, we have 500 cooperating pro bono lawyers now. I have about 60 law students at any one time engaged in the work, and they're not just from New York Law School, they're from all over the area. We also have social work students and college students. But the average length of time is about 17 months to complete a case. So it takes a and, and we always win. So... Um, not because we pick and choose the cases, because the law does work if you advocate well. I mean, the children do have good claims. So those kids need education, and the immigration court really wants them to be in school too, to make sure they're safe. It's an anti-trafficking effect. If you're in school six hours a day, you're probably not being oppressed by a labor exploiter. Long answer. Complex issue. <laughs> Let's see. Wait. Tuesday. Migration Policy Institute, 130 webinar on effects of refugee children in school in the United States and abroad. Yes, Jane. I know that was an incredible presentation. I want to pick up on the point you say about trafficking, um, mm -hmm. because looking at the number of um, kids coming across, looking at the age and the conditions under which they're right. traveling, I mean, trafficking is clearly a risk and will become increasingly a risk as we make borders harder to cross. Um, yes, the price goes up. Yeah. So, I'm just going um, back to the numbers. We have. What is, I mean, and you had the TVs are up there as one option mm -hmm. um, for uh, relief, but what are the screening processes in place for determining whether children have been trafficked either in the movement or whilst here in the United States? So, everyone who receives any kind of federal funding mm -hmm. for being know your rights counsel in the detention centers mm -hmm. has training on how to identify a T visa, yeah. someone who's been trafficked, um, or someone who's been a victim of crime in the United States. So often the children, the smugglers, they're pretty savvy. They hold them in safe houses in northern Mexico, the extortion money is paid, and then maybe they're released. So they don't commit the crime in the United States. Mm -hmm. You need to have a crime in the United States for the U visa. But for the T visa, you don't necessarily have to have that crime in the United States, but you have to have the child have been motivated by a false promise of employment, not just reunification with mom. Mm -hmm. So the T visa, it doesn't completely fit every mm -hmm. single case. Um, further, what I would say is this. I want you to imagine you're 14, and people have been putting guns to your head and threatening you, and you know that the people who talk get stepped on. And suddenly, there's this beautiful young lawyer talking to you and saying, well, tell me you know, about the conditions you were held under, and tell me everything. You can tell me it's safe. Our experience is the stories don't come out until sometimes a year into working timing, having that time Yeah. So by that time, we're pretty far down the road in family court trying to get a guardianship or we're pursuing asylum. Um, here's a story, though, of one young girl. We thought everything was fine. Living with her aunt, met the aunt, cheerful lady, young girl turning 16, very excited to be in the United States, felt so safe because in Honduras, she couldn't go to school at all. It just it was too dangerous. In fact, as I said, the schools have been closing. She was so excited when we met her, and we found a pro bono lawyer for her, and the pro bono lawyer also found a volunteer interpreter. And this lawyer was great, proactive, going out to visit the child in her community, visiting her school, really getting to know her. And she started to sense that there was something not so great in the household. And the young girl was having stomach pains, and they thought the stomach pains might be anxiety. You know, new school, new language, new place. So the lawyer said to her, isn't your aunt taking you to the doctor? Let's get this checked out. And children in New York until the age of 19 get health care. And we also help children in all for that. And uh, the, she said, no, my aunt's always too busy, can't take me. So the lawyer took her to the doctor, and it turned out she has stomach cancer. And it turned out that she'd had this pain for nine months, and no one had detected it, nor taken her seriously. And it also turned out that once she was in the hospital, and safely in the hospital, she started revealing the beatings her aunt was giving her. And her aunt was basically selling her to be the nanny for the neighborhood and charging daycare money, right? And she wasn't being allowed to go to school at all. 
um, only time she was going to school is when the lawyers had given me proof of school. They let her go for a couple of days and then pull her out again. So um, the young girl decided to go against her aunt, even though that would mean breaking ties with her family at home, her grandparents, and the aunt is being criminally prosecuted. And she will definitely get a U visa. Um, but was she also a T? Maybe. She thought she was coming to go to school, not to work. Another example is in Ohio. I spoke in Ohio last week. Um, the U.S. Attorney brought an indictment against some Guatemalan people who signed off to be the loving sponsors. You know, the generous people will take these kids in our home, and they did affidavits of relationship to these children. And a very savvy immigration judge noticed there was a pattern of the kids not showing up. They all seemed to have the same two sponsors. And so sent someone to investigate, and the kids were locked in a trailer every day, and then they were driven around in trucks, and they were a chicken cleaning service, like going to chicken farms and cleaning up the poop and inoculating chickens and plucking chickens. And it was in Marion County, um, Ohio. Ohio actually has a very active anti-trafficking um, state government and local organizations, but these kids were completely under the radar because they weren't in school and they weren't showing up at court and it was the judge who noticed same sponsor everyone. So building trust, again, role of attorneys and social workers and empathetic volunteers. One of the reasons I designed the project to involve law students was I wanted the younger, not all law students are young, but they're younger than me, uh, to build a relationship with the youth. So although I have a class where some of the students are involved in the class trained to do the court screenings, I train volunteers to, to stay for the life of a case. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate to say, well, hey, semester's over, I'm done with your case, especially for a child. So we ask our volunteers to commit to the life of the child's case, unless you go to work for the government or a federal judge, and then you're conflicted out. But um, we do want to try to build that trust relationship. So you mentioned that the I-360... First oh, year, sorry. second year, third year? <laughs> uh, third year, JDL. Um, my okay. name is Ashley. Okay, hi, um, Ashley. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm thrilled. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, I know, that both for the I-360 and for asylum applications, it's um, there's no fee. Right. But once you... The I-360 granting gives you the right to apply for permanent residence. This is a ringer in our crowd. She knows what an I-45 is. Fantastic. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Yeah, there's <laughs> fee Right, but... Right. But there are still the three hundred dollar medical exam. And yeah, we get it for one hundred and fifty in New York. Oh, really? The okay. medical fees, the, the the licensed federal physicians that are authorized to do the medical check. Everyone who immigrates to the United States has to have a medical check. Um, maybe because of the population density or competition, we have more doctors in New York. We can get the one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, I do a lot of fundraising. Um, oh, okay. I go to donors a lot. I have one wealthy donor has given us money for medical costs. And transportation, for example, if you live in Long Island and you have to come to the immigration court, it's a $54 round trip ticket. Mm -hmm. So the first year I did this volunteer work, I spent about $6,000 of my own money, and then my husband said, can you stop? Um, it's also kind of inappropriate. You know, um, we lawyers, we, we want to be generous, but we also have to have some boundaries, and so try to do some fundraising. But trying to get immigration to do fee waivers for all of it would be a great idea, but they haven't agreed to yet. But it's a very good point. And, you know, you're going to find those obstacles. This work is not like representing adults because there's other obstacles. A kid has to drop out of school because they have no more money. Um, the uncle they were staying with loses his job. They're living in illegal boarding houses or overcrowded environments. Girls get pregnant. Boys impregnate. We, we do... My little project has added <coughs> social workers and added safe sex trainings because most of the young people we meet have never had any sex education at all. <laughs> kind of culturally imperialist of me, isn't it? Yes, it's okay. I'm all right with it. I, I really think they complicate their lives by having children, you know, without the full support they need. And of course, just make sure you know, having a baby here does not give you the right to stay here. Once the baby is born, yes, the baby's a U.S. citizen, but the baby would have to be 21 before they could sponsor you. And if you've been living here illegally, you're barred for 10 years. So it's not the way to immigrate to the United States. And it doesn't necessarily give you any <coughs> greater equities. Another question. Yes. Hi. Um, so I have a question about repatriation and how yeah. that works. You were talking about how ICE um, works to to deport people in Mexico. Yeah. Right. So how does that? How do they make sure that they're being deported to a family member somewhere safe? I listened to a documentary about potentially using DNA as a way of reuniting. Mm -hmm. 
We use DNA in our refugee processing now, and we're using DNA in the overseas processing for the Central Americans that will be able to come on the 4,000 quota. We're, we're insisting on evidence because there is a pattern around the world, and and I think it's completely legitimate one. You know, my grandmother came with this made-up family. When somebody gets to immigrate to the United States, maybe they won the lottery, or they're coming with employment, or they're coming through refugee status, they suddenly have more children because you go and beg them and you say, make, make my son your son, make my daughter your daughter. So many countries of the world do use DNA processing. One of the problems, of course, is in certain parts of the world it's very hard to access. Uh, with Mexico, we simply take the word of the Mexican government that the officials at the border have appropriate training in child protection, and we don't take any more responsibility. With Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, when our planes come in on the tarmac, there's a government officer who separates people under 18 and over 18. The under 18 are then taken, and they, they can see a physician if they want to. There's a social works government official there. They say, is there an adult here to pick you up? And if the kid says yes, they say, good luck to you. So my students last year, there were two of them who were Guatemalan-American. Their parents were from Guatemala. They were upset with the entire project. They were saying, Benson, I think you've got this all wrong. These, ch 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 these children, Guatemala is not unsafe. These children should go back to Guatemala. It's a beautiful country. We should work on repatriation. So they volunteered with Kids in Need of Defense, which has a repatriation project in Guatemala. They came back radicalized. They want every child to stay in the United States. And part of that had to do with the wealth disparity that they saw, the revenue and the financing that different aid organizations are going to stay in the government, and they don't necessarily get to the kids. And they said until our government, Guatemala, their, you know, their parents' heritage is going to do more for these kids, they should stay here. So to make this a little more concrete, boy is 14, takes a deportation order, had no lawyer, shows up in Guatemala. My student, Carlos, is greeting him. The boy and his father say to the Guatemalan government, we live in a mountainous village. It will cost the equivalent of $8 to go back to our village on the bus. But I sold everything I had to get here to pick him up. Can we have $8 for the bus, or can you give us a bus voucher? And they said, no, we don't have any revenue for you. And the boy said, don't worry, Dad. When I was in the United States, they gave me these beautiful shoes. So we will go to the market and we will sell the, shoes, sell the shoes so that we can go back to our village. So the U.S. could do more. If we are going to re repatriate, we could do more to make it sustainable. Because that young man then interviewed by Carlos said, I will wait till next summer, but I will try again because I have to. Because I will die if I stay in the hills. Now, some of this is poverty, and there's also been a um, blight, a food blight, in parts of Guatemala. There's been a fungus on coffee growing. Um, so add all the push factors of parents or relatives in the United States, the economic disparities, the lack of civil society, and then you add a food crisis. And yes, there are people who are coming to have a better life. So they don't necessarily qualify for asylum, but they might qualify for special immigrant juvenile status. Although then you get into this culturally relative issue of what is neglect. What is neglect in North Carolina law or New York law, California law, it's a pretty high standard. What is neglect in Guatemala is at 12 you stop school and you go to work because you have to help. Just like my grandma's picture, she had to stop school at 12 to take care of her older sister's children. Was she neglected? Or did she have a great life? Better that than the pogroms in Russia. That's what she would always say. OK, more. I have really fast answers, don't I? But I've been talking about this for a long time. I hope it doesn't sound too glib. I'm going to take you, and then I'm going to come back to you, OK? Uh, I'm Elise. I'm a 3L. Thank you for coming. Um, I was just wondering what level of success you've seen for unaccompanied children coming from Central America with asylum applications in particular, and um, what just with the BIA's kind of cabining of, you know, uh, fear of gang violence and that kind of thing, what particular social group you've seen to be most successful articulated as yeah, that was for asylum? Yeah, one of my slides that was in the wrong place, very embarrassing. Um, groups that have worked, so sexual orientation, um, family. We have been very successful. So my name is Benson, so let's imagine I live in a village in El Salvador, and my father was a witness against the gang chief and then was killed. And my brother stood up against them and then ran away. And my mother has said, they threatened you at school yesterday. Go. Don't wait. Go now. So I've never really had much of a threat other than, hey, come over here and be with us or we're going to get you. Or, oh, you're one of those Bensons, 
right? That has been pretty successful. There's no published opinions. When you win at the asylum office, there's no written opinion you can use. But what we do is, as the nonprofits in New York, we do share the wins, and we share the affidavits, and we share the material put together. We've also been effective, please don't make it go away, uh, lack of effective familial protection. So when you have no child protection services and you have no orphanages, uh, we're saying that these children are like the women who are abused in marriage. This is an analogous argument. Um, let me get to that. There it is. Um, matter of ARCG. You can take the same kind of argument and say the w reason those women deserve protection from us is they cannot get it in their own country. So we've been somewhat successful with that. The younger the child, you can, you'd think you'd always be successful, but then the officer has to have the child identify the nexus. So last year we had the asylum office come to school and speak to an audience of about 300 people about what they want to hear. And one officer quite seriously said this, a child is not prepared to make their claim in our office unless they can articulate the nexus element. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so being the moderator and being rude, I said, and how do you ask that question? I say, well, tell me why you're persecuted. And you're an 11-year-old, you know. If they can say, I'm part of the Benson family, if they can say, I have no adult male in my family can take care of me, maybe that helps. So you really do have to prepare the child to be able to make that connection. And of course, some of you may know, in the asylum office, it's not an adversarial process, so the attorney is there, but they're not supposed to do a direct exam with the child. You are allowed to have your comfort adult, so the child can bring a comfort adult with them. It may be grandma, it may be a friend, and you're allowed to pace the interview appropriately so the child can take breaks. You're not supposed to have food at the asylum office, but usually with kids, you can bring some crackers. But yeah, we don't have good case law yet. We need you to make it. Back over here. I'll come back to you. I just had a question about the special on immigration. Uh, special immigration juvenile? Mm -hmm. On the chart there, is it something about like, everything <coughs> Like, halfway to like permanent residence or citizenship. Right. And I'm just like, I don't know. I, how does it work? Yeah. How does, okay. it, how does you get from, like, if you establish that, that status, right. how do you get from there? To okay. So, legal immigration, we have 140,000 for employment based. We have about half a million for family based. We have about a million legal immigrants here. And they're all in a quota system except for those that are married to U.S. citizens or the uh, parents of U.S. citizens, et cetera. So once you filed this special immigrant juvenile petition, it's actually assigned to the fourth preference, employment-based. Um, last year there were 9,000. We're going to get the quota soon. Um, then when that petition is approved, because the children are in removal proceedings, the government will usually terminate the removal proceedings, making jurisdiction move over to USCIS. Then you can file an application for adjustment of status. If the child has not been detected and is not already in removal proceedings, you can do an affirmative filing with USCIS, both the visa petition and the application to adjust. They're eligible to adjust, even though they made an illegal entry and they were in proceedings because SIG is one of the only statutes besides the U visa, the victim of crime, that waives inspection at the border. However, you cannot use this status to petition for someone to come from overseas. So if you're, if you're the mama and you're here and your children are being neglected in Guatemala or anywhere in the world and you want to use SIG to get an order in family court and then send for them, it won't work. It's only for children who are living in our society, and it's basically a recognition. Let's give those children status. Now, the quid pro quo, they cannot sponsor their parents, even the non-abusing parent. And they can't later sponsor their siblings should they become a citizen. Of course, sponsoring your sibling is a 10 to 15 year wait anyway. So, more of a theoretical. Does that help? Maybe one more question. One more? Okay. Lydia, I was actually going to make a statement on and he's fabulous, and he's on the podcast, um, which Sarah has the recording of in the Dropbox. Derek knows what he's talking about. Once USIS approves the 360 and you take it to the immigration judge down in Charlotte, they want to know what ICE Council thinks. And ICE Council, within the last two months, has required you to send in the Copies family everything. court complaint and petition yeah. and any intermediate orders, and then they re-adjudicate it and decide whether it's fit and appropriate to terminate proceedings. So you have and to fight if, that. If they don't like it, they send it back to USIS and say, oh, well, uh -huh. you messed this up, and just mm -hmm. hold everything up. So it's not it's as better in, New York. in Charlotte yeah. um, as, it, as, as elsewhere. It is better in New York, although they are starting to 
uses USCIS, the Immigration Service, is not supposed to re-adjudicate what the family court did, but there was some fraud detected, mostly with people from the Punjab region. And that got on NBC News, and that made USCIS go crazy. And ICE is also concerned about trafficking and SIG hiding trafficking. So we have to be pretty tenacious. And the problem is when you're trapped inside an administrative law system, the tools lawyers would normally use in a court system, like making motions to move a proceeding along or temporary restraining orders or injunctions or order to show cause, doesn't exist in immigration law. So maybe we're going to have to do some litigation. You know, like, go ahead, judge, deny the case right now so I can appeal it to the BIA because there's no interlocutory appeals. Um, and it's tough when you're representing a child client. You may be very cause-oriented, but you also have to protect the best interests of that child. Derek really knows what he's doing, and we did a great podcast. I, I, I mean, you did most of it. I made up a hypothetical, and then Derek and another lawyer, and I'm blinking right now. Joanna, a North Carolinian lawyer, we went through the hypothetical under North Carolina law. So um, it, you can do it. It can be done, right? Thank you so much. I think we have to... We have to stop, but I'm going to stand up here. What's up? We're, you're not moving me away. Are we going to vacate the room? Another, yeah, We're going to another room. Yeah, so... Um, but if there's anyone interested, we are going to have a smaller session with um, with Lenny Benson after. So you, if you have time, maybe you could stay on for that. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much. This was an excellent presentation.